Hi there. So we are going to go over 4.4 and 4.5 now. Um, this is our last lecture. It's officially the last lecture that we're going to have for this class this year. So that is kind of sad and kind of exciting at the same time. Okay, so anyway, um, we finished up 4.1, 2, and 3 talking about um, weather and climate and how that's going to impact ecosystems. <coughs> And we talked about how different interactions are going to impact how organisms live together and where they can live. And now we're going to talk about the places they live. So the actual areas, um, all of these factors come together and define these areas. So the first group of areas we're going to look at are terrestrial biomes. Terrestrial is just meaning land-based as opposed to like aquatic and marine, which is in the water. So um, the Earth's terrestrial ecosystems. They are broken up into biomes, um, which in a biome is just a collection of ecosystems that are similar to each other. Um, you're really going to be looking at averages and, and sort of grouping them together based on temperature and precipitation and sunlight and things like that. Um, so biomes are described in terms of their biotic and abiotic factors. Um, so when you look at a biome, Abiotic factors, temperature, precipitation, climate, <clears throat> biotic are going to be like the plants and animals that live there. Um, so that's sort of the thing that we look at when dividing them up. There are roughly 10, sometimes more, um, depending on what book you're looking at. Um, but we'll kind of talk about the ones that are in your book. All right, so the major terrestrial biomes. Um, and you should have all heard of these before. Tropical rainforest, um, tropical dry forest, that might be a new one you may not have heard of. Um, tropical grassland, savanna, shrubland, those all kind of are in the same area. Um, of course, the desert. Then we have temperate grasslands, um, temperate woodlands, also sometimes called a chaparral, which is gonna be, oops, move this over so you can see that word. So that is going to be like an area in, um, in, in Southern California, like out in LA is similar that area. Um, the temperate forest or like it's usually called the temperature, uh, excuse me, temperate deciduous forest. Um, that's where we live. Then we have the coniferous forest or northwestern coniferous forest. So there's large conifers that you see like up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, the boreal forest, also called the taiga. You've probably heard it called that before, which sort of borders, um, you know, the tundra. Um, the taiga is going to be an area that's going to be... Um, a lot of in Alaska is that area. And then you have the tundra, which is basically um, a frozen desert, really very low precipitation, very cold, not a whole lot of plant life, um, can't support a whole lot of life just because it's um, pretty extreme environment. All right, so this is in your book. I would take a look at it. It is just a map that sort of shows you the distribution of these over um, the globe, around the globe. And it also, you can look at it and see how, um, you know, depending on where they're located, their distance from the equator is going to kind of determine whether they're tropical or temperate, um, things like that, which I think makes sense. All right, so now our aquatic ecosystems. When you're looking at things, you know, water-based ecosystems, you're really going to be um, looking at and defining it by the how deep the water is, um, the temperature, whether it's a moving body of water, the amount of dissolved nutrients there for the plants and the animals. Um, the area that is near the surface is called the photic zone. So they call it photic. So that P-H-O-T-I-C, you should think photosynthesis. So it's going to be the area where photosynthesis occurs because it's where the sun reaches. Makes sense, right? And then once you extend beyond that area where the sun can penetrate, that's called the aphotic zone. So there's no photosynthesis taking place in those regions. Um, so the dissolved sub substances, so oxygen, you have to have dissolved oxygen. And then we talked about like nitrogen and phosphorus and things like that. They have to be there and dissolved in a form that can be used by the organisms that live there. Um, and the availability of these is going to kind of determine where an organism can live. All right, so our freshwater ecosystems, streams, lakes, rivers, um, freshwater wetlands like us down in South Georgia, we have the Okefenokee Swamp. 
Um, then around us, we have this area. So it's a special kind of a wetland. It's called an estuary, where it is where the a river and the sea kind of come together. So we have estuaries all along the coast of Georgia. Um, and I think we're very familiar with it. We kind of take for granted um, that this is something unique, but it's that area where it is the mix of the fresh and the salt water. Um, it is going to be affected greatly by the, the tides and the rise and fall of the ocean and things. Um, then we also, when we look at the ocean, we're going to look at them and we're going to divide them up based on not only how deep they are, but how far away they are from the coast. Okay, so if you're looking at the area closest to the land, um, that's going to be the intertidal zone. As you move out, the coastal zone or coastal ocean is going to extend out till like the end of the continental shelf and then beyond that is the open ocean that tends to be very deep all right so the intertidal zone um the organisms that live there have to kind of be specially adapted because they are going to be submerged part of the time and not submerged so we understand these we go to the beach all the time and you can kind of see that area where you can see like the little fiddler crabs and you can see other organisms that um sort of live in that area um, so obviously they have to be very well adapted, um, and be able to survive being wet and being dry and they have to, the currents and the wave, the force of the waves and things, they have to be able to withstand that. So very specific adaptation. So you're talking right there, literally at that edge where the tide, low tide to high tide zone, intertidal. All right, so the coastal ocean, this is going to be where that low tide, as low as it goes, where it's not going to recede past that, from that to the end, basically, of the continental shelf. Um, that's going to vary depending on what coast you're on. So us on the East Coast, um, we have a very, very long continental shelf. It's very big. It extends very far from the coast. So we have quite a large co uh, coastal ocean. But on the West Coast, where it goes out and drops very, very quickly, um, they're going to have a very tiny coastal ocean. It's going to go out into open ocean very quickly, as opposed to us. So a lot of times people who want to go deep sea fishing, actually in Georgia, have to go out way farther than they would if they were on the coast of California, because it takes a lot longer for us to get past that continental shelf. Um, obviously, the coastal ocean is going to have a lot of sunlight because it's not very deep, and it's going to have a lot of nutrients that it receives from the runoff <coughs> from land. So it can be a very productive area. You can have a lot of organisms um, that live there. So, okay, Sophie. Shh, shh, shh. All right, so open ocean into the continental shelf and outward until you hit basically the next continental shelf. So 90% of the world's oceans are open ocean. They range in depth greatly from 500 meters to 10,000 meters. So you're talking a huge, huge range in, um, in depths. And um, even though they are huge, um, and they are enormous. Like I said, the majority of the ocean is open ocean, but it is very, very low nutrients. Um, you don't have a whole lot of um, phytoplankton or those photosynthetic organisms. Um, but um, because it is so big, most of the photosynthesis on Earth occurs in that sunlit top sort of 100 meters of the open ocean even though it's not terribly productive you don't have a ton of producers there simply due to the sheer size of it it's like most of the earth um that is going to be a very very um productive area in terms of creating um oxygen and photosynthesis all right, so we have that permanently dark aphotic zone, the deepest, deepest part of the oceans. I always love documentaries. Whenever they go down there, you can see all the crazy adaptations of the organisms. Um, they are um, crazy looking. They're way down there in the dark and the deep. Um, food webs in that aphotic zone, they are based on um, a lot of times scavengers. So whales will die and like sink down and then all of the scavengers and the organisms will come in and eat. So their food web, they will be at the base of that. Um, or it could be from the chemosynthetic organisms. So back when we talked about that uh, deep oceanic vents um, that release that sulfur and sulfur containing compounds, that organisms use that to make energy. 
Um, so it, it, either through that process, that's how they get their energy or from those organisms that fall from the photic zone. So the dead plants and animals that kind of sink down. Um, so that's sort of a, a different kind of food web than we're used to. Um, so that's pretty much it. Please take some time to look at, at really at the characteristics of the different biomes. Um, I'm not going to go through them because you can read it in the book. They're very well laid out. Pages 112, 113, 114, and 115. They have big sections that really go through a lot of the abiotic and biotic factors that you find in these that distinguish them between the other things. So take some time to study those. That information will be on the test. All right, um, let me know if you have any questions. Thanks.